You know, Nate, I got a degree in music education, and um, in no part of that music degree did I ever get a business education. And uh, so as I moved through my 20s and 30s, I kind of had to self-educate. And I got to be honest, I, I went a little overboard. <laughs> um, mm. Probably read a little too much, watched a little too much, uh, got a little bit confused. Right. Oh, this person says this, but this person says that. And those are kind of actually diametrically opposed to one another. Like, what am I supposed to do? Um, yeah. And so as I went through my 30s and got into my 40s, I kind of toned it down. But I still, I still do take time every week to self-educate, to, to keep up on what's going on in marketing, to keep up on what's going on in business, to listen to things that motivate and inspire me. And about two months ago, um, I was on YouTube and YouTube knows that I love Naval Ravikant. Mm. And for those of you who've maybe never listened to the podcast before, I probably quote this guy every third episode. Um, he's just a business genius. He's an older guy. He's very wise. Now is the founder of AngelList. He was an early investor in Twitter and Uber and all the big name startups of the 2000s. And I noticed a new interview came out with him. And during that interview, he mentioned a book. Actually, now that I think about it, I think it was more than a couple months ago. It was, <laughs> I think it was actually last year. Um, yeah, because, because you now I recommended it to me. Yes, like, it was last like year. Yeah, yeah. Um, because I know because I read the first part of this book on a flight, and I know that that trip was last year. Anyway, the book that this guy recommended, um, that Naval recommended, uh, was by a guy named Matt Mokri, and the book is called The Great CEO Within. Mm. And what I found so interesting about Naval, despite the fact that you know he's been incredibly successful, he's founded several profitable companies, et cetera, et cetera, he still has a business coach, and Matt is his business coach. Mm. And um, I read this book very quickly. It's actually a very thin book. For those of you who are listening, I'm would would remind you that you can also watch these on YouTube and I'm holding the book up right now. Uh, right. Not a long read, not a long read, um, but very, very helpful. And Nate and I decided, Hey, let's just talk about this book. Cause I feel like this book was um, inspiring for me. I mentioned it to you. You said it was inspiring to you. And we thought it's been a while since we've done a resource episode where we've talked about favorite resources or books or this sort of thing. And, so that's what we're doing today. Um, welcome back to the podcast. I'm Daniel. This is Nate. And we help music school owners uh, run a fun, profitable, sustainable music school business. Whether you want to own it or sell it, uh, we help schools grow. Now, before we jump into um, our little book report here today, Nate, I do want to remind yeah. folks that this podcast is sponsored by two different really awesome educational tools. Uh, one is Big Music Games, which Nate has uh, invented over there at Brooklyn Music Factory. And our other yep. is the Piano Express from grouplessons.com. If you'd like more information on either of these, um, obviously you can check out Piano Express, a really amazing group piano curriculum that allows teachers um, or school owners to run classes, piano classes of up to 12 at a time with just one teacher. Mm. Um, we've seen studios run a 240 kid music studio with just two teachers and a handful of teacher assistants. Um, and you can check that out at grouplessons.com. Nate, I want to kick it over to you to talk a little bit about big music games and the genesis of how that yeah. came about. As our listeners know, Brooklyn Music Factory is a songwriting program that's um, a game-based sort of fluency first approach. And big music games is the foundation of that. Our teachers, myself included, all play games every single lesson, whether it's in our group classes, like Mini Keys Jam Band 101, or in our private lesson architecture, we oftentimes open with a game. Um, so anyways, Big Music is Games has been available for quite some time now to teachers and schools around the world, and, and a bunch of uh, awesome teachers are gamifying their lessons right now at bigmusicgames.com backslash 7FMS, the number 7FMS. And it's totally free to start gaming right now. So Ooh, if cool. you're listening and you're like, I want to play games, drop by there today. You'll be up in gaming with, you know, in less than a minute. And uh, you can start gaming. And then from there, you can, uh, you know, connect to our whole community of teachers. Let's jump into the, um, into the book here, Nate. Love Great it. CEO Within. Got my copy. And the, 
Yeah. And the first thing I want to bring up, just um, we're going to talk about some concepts that really stood out to us in this episode, but I want to frame this um, because if you're listening right now, you might think, okay, well, why would I want to listen to this episode or why is this book so special? I want to mm. talk about something I've heard over and over and over again for the last seven years. And it's not every person who approaches me. Um, I talk to a lot of studio owners each week. Um, I've talked to at least nine to 12 studio owners a week for the past six weeks. Um, just people reaching out about 7FMS or grouplessons.com or mm. you know doing work or marketing, group lessons, like all this stuff. And something I hear on a consistent basis is a studio owner, a school owner saying, I just wish there was a step-by-step -step plan for how to run this business. Yeah. Okay. Now here's what's interesting. That's what this book is. It, this yeah, is dude, the it, thing that people it, say they want. So first off, I do want to say that this book is designed with startups in mind. Okay. So there is some talk about, you know, tech, very, it, it's sprinkled throughout the book, but the genius of this book is that it really is just the basics. It is the framework. And if one were to want to say like, okay, well, I want to run an efficient, clean business, uh, no fluff, like this is the thing. But here's, here's what's so interesting about that. People say they want that. But what I feel will happen, what I know mm. will happen, is people mm. will read this book and then go to execute and what this book is missing is something that no book can provide. And that is the wisdom to know how to execute this. Um, it's the difference between knowing the words to say and feeling it down to the core of who you are. It's the difference between having a formula and intuitively being able to execute that formula. It's the difference, to go back to a few episodes, it's the difference between just knowing how to show up in an open house or try a lesson and just absolutely dazzle that parent. It's the difference between that and maybe reading a book on sales and having this really uh, tight and efficient framework and going through it. And at the end, the person doesn't sign up. But wait, I followed all the steps here. Like, why didn't it work? Yeah. that That's the thing. So what I want to say before we get into this, not this isn't an unrecommendation for the book. It's just that I think that people think that what they need is just that step-by-step but the thing they have to add to it is they have to put in the reps. They have to work yes. it. They have to see what went right, what went wrong. They have to evaluate. And, and really, still, it comes down to building the wisdom and the experience to actually run the company. But this will save you time. And that's why I think a book like this is so important. <laughs> yeah. Can I, Daniel, my oh, take please. on that? I love that. It's You got to put in the reps. I totally appreciate that. Um, perspective on this. And I, the way I frame it in my mind, because I literally was thinking this, dude, as I was reading and I was like, man, mm. I remember when we tried to implement that. Why did we give up on that? <laughs> you know what I mean? The sure. way I read this is like, you have to be willing to fail X number of times in your attempts mm. before you're going to have that experiential knowledge of being like, oh, wait, this is the version that's going to work at my music school. And so that I hear reps as an opportunity to fail and fail fast and then essentially sculpt the version. You know, you and I are going to cite like three or four or five different takeaways from this. So our listeners yeah. will, will, will hear that in a moment and say like, oh, that's, that's badass. I want to do that. Mm. Well, I hear what you're saying is, okay, start doing it. Do it as soon as reasonably possible. And then understand that you're likely going to find an iteration like you'll fail a few times at trying to implement and on the third or fourth or fifth time you'll have an iteration that actually does work for your school that you can sustain with all your teachers you can sustain mm -hmm. with your staff so yeah that's my i dig the rep comment daniel because yeah. i think you're right on the money there so, um, so I, I think that's the overarching framework but yep. let's not stay overarching. Let's like kind of dive into some of the nitty gritties. What's the first big takeaway that you found as you read this, Nate? One that you feel okay. is really important to share. Yeah, Matt talks a bunch about this. I, he uses this word or this phrase, sloppy agreements, hmm. which basically what he's saying is 
in every school out there, mm. there's a set of agreements between the people working at the school. It could be around getting something done, a very specific project, like, hey, we're going to set up a marketing dashboard, just like Daniel teaches us in that class, and we're going to look at it every week. So there could be a specific project-focused agreement with an ongoing um, task, or it could be some sort of agreement about where you set the bar with your teachers, i.e., you know, we talk about this a bunch when we talked about the Musician's Journey Report, but also this idea of like, at BMF, there's an agreement that every 20, within 24 hours, you're going to send a lesson report home. Mm -hmm. So Matt uses, says, basically, there are way too many sloppy agreements happening in companies. And it actually poisons the whole culture. And a sloppy agreement, he, he basically says, like, it's not precisely defined. It doesn't say exactly, you know, what's going to get done, who's going to do it, and by when. And so you have enough of these sloppy agreements that live in your music school. And as a result, the whole culture of the school is that nobody really trusts that anybody's really going to do what they say they're going to do um, at the level that they say they're going to do it. There's not the follow through and there's not the timely manner of it. Yes. I have a lot to say about that. And it kind of leads into my takeaway. I think the, the section that most impacted me was section three, which had the agreements chapter yeah. in it. Um, and it's only a 30, there's like six, seven chapters in part three. It's from page 41 to 72 in the edition that I have. Mm -hmm. Agreements is the third one. Um, I want to talk about a couple of concepts in the whole group habits section, but let's talk about the agreements one first, because that's actually one that really stood out to me. Many years ago, uh, one of my business coaches um, gave me a recording and it was called Agreements Versus Expectations. Mm. And the idea is that owners, and I don't mean like owners of schools, but someone who owns their life, someone who owns the, the responsibility, someone who owns their decisions, someone who owns the consequences of their decisions, yep. a responsible, mature adult makes agreements with people. When you're not operating at your highest self, you just throw expectations out into the universe and then are upset when you when they are not met. Okay. I'm gonna I'm gonna make this a little less personal. <laughs> mm, there there's this there's this website called Nextdoor. Um and it's a it's a website that it's a social media network, but instead of it being about the people, you know, friends or people you follow, Nextdoor connects people in neighborhoods. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Cool. Every year, the day after July 4th, I get a notification from next door of all the most active threads. And it's all these people complaining about other people setting off fireworks too late. I have kids. I've got to be up in the morning. You scared my dogs, like all this sort of thing. <laughs> right. Those people had expectations that on July 4th, no one would interrupt their sleep. Okay. I have to be honest, even though that might be even though that might seem reasonable, I don't mm. think it's an expectation that one should have had on everyone else in the world around them. <laughs> yeah, right. What they should have done is gone out and bought a cheap pair of $1 foam earplugs that would have allowed them to not hear all that noise. Mm. That's what they should have done. I think that's that, that difference. When you have expectations, you're essentially asking everyone else in the world to either read your mind or do what you want. And that's just not realistic. The more realistic thing to do, especially in a professional context, let's leave the fireworks alone, um, especially in a professional context, is to make agreements with people. And what's interesting is at the end of the agreements chapter, I'm just going to actually go there and read the final couple lines because yeah. I think yeah. I think this is just incredible. Um, there must be consequences for breaking agreements. Implementing these consequences is a two-part process. The first time someone doesn't meet an agreement, you point it out to them immediately. If they apologize, you respond that apologies are not needed. And all this requires that they only make agreements that they can commit to and that they meet all the agreements they make, whether by adherence or by prompt communication, that they need to alter the agreement. If the person continues to fill out these, there is only one consequence that makes sense. They can no longer be part of the company. Mm. That goes for employees or for customers. 
Mm. And what I think is so interesting, there's a little line in there, and I think it, I, I read, I read this fast, and I think one could miss this. If they apologize, you respond that apologies are not needed. And all this requires that they only make agreements that they can commit to. Yeah. What he's subtly saying there is that this is not a social thing. This is a professional thing. We do not operate at the social level in a professional environment. And what I often see people doing, studio owners doing, school owners doing, is they operate at this social level when they need in this like space of emotion in this space of do they like me do they not like me none of that matters it's agreements we make agreements with people that's how you create a culture um that's really healthy emotionally healthy that's safe to work in both for you and the other person and um yeah that's what i have to say you need to make agreements stop putting expectations on other people um if you can't yeah, have the conversation that. with someone, if you can't have an adult conversation with someone, tell them what the agreement is, ask if they can meet it, and you're just kind of like inferring things or 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 you know putting little subtle hints out there. This is this is why this is why it can be quite stressful to be at your job. So, anyways, enough on impeccable agreements, but I really like the addition where you say everyone actually has to fully agree to this, and then everyone has to commit to it, and and um. You know, Matt, Matt says clearly that it needs to be in writing what you've committed to. That doesn't have to be fancy. It could just literally you write in the task, I'm committing to doing X by this date. Okay. Yeah. So, Back to you on this, uh, on, on your takeaway, because I know yeah. we've, we've been diving deep on agreements. Yeah. So that was just one part of the group habit section. I actually just am going to read a couple lines. What Love are it. group habits? Um, I'm just going to read from the book. No matter how original and innovative your ideas might be, And no matter how efficient and productive your own habits might be, you won't be able to build a truly exceptional organization alone. Your company's success depends on how well its members work together. And just as individuals develop habits, so do groups. So this whole section is about the kinds of habits that you set up as a group. We talked Mm -hmm. about that agreements one. I think that's a really important one. I'm just going to briefly name two others that are in here. Honestly, every chapter in this book is worth its weight in gold um, and far more. But uh, two others that I thought were really interesting. One of the longest chapters in the book is the first one in the group habits section, which is decision making. And I think this will be helpful for people who either feel like they don't know what decisions to make, or if you're on the other end of this perspective and you just can't seem to let your, the decision making apparatus go, you can't hand off responsibility to other people. This section will be really helpful for you because it shows you how to make decisions in a group. It gives a framework for how to make what he calls, quote, rapid decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, And then how to take the decisions that are made and actually actualize them, which kind of leads to my final takeaway. I'm not going to spoil that one yet. Um, But then the other thing that I got out of the group habit section was a simple exercise where on an occasional basis, when you're working with your team, you ask them, What would you do if you were CEO? By the way, this is something I actually do. I go to team members and I ask them to say, if you were in charge, what three things would you change? And of course, they don't have the perspective that I have. They might not be thinking as long-term as I think. They might not be thinking about the same issues or have the same concerns I do. That's actually the point. I sometimes get feedback. I sometimes get answers to this question that I think, Ooh, that's, that's not a big picture thing that the first time I did this, uh, the, you know, some of the responses I got back, I thought, Oh, this isn't really all that important. But then I looked at what they actually wrote. I thought, Oh, this is really important to them. This is something that they see as a problem. And I identified customer service issues that I never would have thought about because I wasn't dealing with those issues. And we actually made changes that saved time. It saved money. It made their job more uh, enjoyable to perform and doing this on an occasional basis with the caveat to them that, Hey, just because you make the suggestion doesn't mean it'll happen, but I really, really want your input. And then actually having the meeting with the team member and, and, and talking through what they uh, sent to you can be really, really helpful, really gets you on the same page and even gives you an opportunity to listen and also to educate as to 
uh, and educating them on kind of what your perspective is on the issue that they're bringing up. So those are just a few takeaways that I had from the group habits section. Um, and there's a lot more other habits that one could enact in your company that is in here. And once again, can't recommend this book more. Nate, any thoughts about what I said, or do you want to jump to your next takeaway? I think I can jump straight over to the next takeaway. Nice. Um, and it's, you know, we've done some great episodes, by the way, in terms of how to get better input from your teachers and from your team. And I think you're just, you're hitting that squarely when he, his tactic mm. of what, what three changes would you make if you were CEO? So the next section that I really, really enjoyed um, was his solid infrastructure section. So let me just be clear on where that is in the book for everyone. Uh, that's part four. Yeah. Um, yeah. Page whatever, 79. Yep. Um, and I'm going to read actually again, because I, I think it's really valuable to hear Matt's words. Uh, Without a solid infrastructure, your brilliant and talented team members, and I'm going to actually substitute because I started doing this when reading this book. I just swapped out words that were relevant to me mm. at BMF. So without a solid infrastructure, your brilliant and talented teachers won't be able to function to their full, full potential. The key components of a solid music school infrastructure are a company folder system and wiki, goal tracking tools, areas of responsibility, no single point of failure, and KPIs or key performance indicators. So company folder system at BMF, G Drive. Yeah. Wiki, G Doc, that is our company manual that just is perpetually getting updated whenever we make changes. Goal tra and as, in addition to training manuals. So Wiki would be company manual, private lesson training manual, and band class training manual camp training manual. So that's what we mean by wiki in our world. Mm. Okay. Goal tracking tools. We use Asana. It's just a project management tool. Areas of responsibility. I'll talk about it in a second. No single point of failure. This is a fascinating concept. And then KPIs, key performance indicators. This is the area that I'm actually going to zero in on for a second. Love it. Rather than dive in deeply. But um, any thoughts before I jump into KPIs? No, not at all. I'd, I'd love to hear that. Well, okay. actually, let me ask you a question. Yo. The KPIs that you've chosen to talk about here, are they the ones that he's talking about in the book or are they ones that you have specifically chosen that are relevant to music schools? I have chosen some relevant to music schools, but I've used his infrastructure. So when he talks about KPIs, key performance indicators, uh, let me read his brief description of a key performance indicator because... This is an example of something that we did at BMF for a while, but I'm not sure we, we didn't, we don't still do it, which means we didn't do a sustainable version for us. Mm. So I was fascinated and really it piqued my interest when he brought it up again. So he says, determine the music school's five or six most significant key performance indicators, then track them religiously and make them available for the entire school to easily see on a daily basis. And then he says, like, post the metrics on a TV screen or some central mm. place. Um, we've done versions where it's just on a dry erase board, right? So he then says there are KPIs or metrics based on department. And this is where I borrowed. He said finance, sales, engineering. He's, again, this whole book is geared towards, if you're a software company, it's a very Silicon Valley focused book. So like you said in the open, you just have to understand, you have to swap out where engineering doesn't make sense the place like Brooklyn Music Factory, curriculum design. Exactly. Makes sense, right. Yeah. Student so, engineering. <laughs> yeah. It's still engineering. <laughs> You're engineering the student's experience in the classroom. Okay. So, uh, and then he uses recruiting, right? So hiring, we talk a ton about hiring, onboarding, yep. training, retaining great teachers. Okay. So I grabbed KPIs just from the finance, uh, sorry, finance, uh, and then I did a marketing and sales version too. Okay. Um, so I said, okay, here are KPIs that I would potentially start posting on a board for the entire school to see. Mm. Uh, here are a few finance examples. Number one, cash flow. Do we mm. have enough cash in the bank to make sure that everybody on the team is going to get paid? 
and how many months out. So next one, net income. That's just a percentage of every dollar that we make at BMF. What percentage is left over that we can actually invest in things that we care about, whether it's new equipment, um, you know, uh, new curriculum design, the things that we care about at Brooklyn Music Factory, right? Another KPI for finance is I put cost of labor. What percentage are we actually spending on the humans right now in the company? And we've done some episodes on that. Mm. Um, and so what's interesting to me and what will be, I'm sure some of the listeners are saying, number one, they might be asking like, wait, I don't even know how to calculate that yet. Mm. Okay, fair enough. That's why you go out and ask for help. You do your research. Back to your comment, Daniel. Every week is an opportunity to level up your skills in some way, shape, or form. You're not going to level up across the board. You're going to level up in specific areas. Don't go wide. Go deep, right? So if you're like, I really want to get my finance together in 2024, great. Make that one of your learning objectives for the year. Mm-hmm. So cash flow, net income, cost of labor, be able to calculate those quickly and easily. Um, okay. Number two, the question that I think a lot of listeners, and then I'm going to pop, ping it over to you, Daniel. I think a lot of the listeners are going to ask the question of like, wait, what? You share this with everybody? Mm. You're transparent about that? Well, Matt makes it really clear here where he says, okay, don't share individual compensation unless you're really, really well-trained in radical transparency at your company. Mm. Because that gets weird quickly. Yeah. <laughs> Right. One teacher is going to be like, why is this person getting 45 an hour and and I'm getting 38 an hour? And then next thing you know, as he says, people are trying to curry favors with you. They're coming to ask you individually rather than subscribing to some sort of system of compensation that you've designed in your music school. Um, So he says, don't share individual compensation. Right. Because that gets weird. And otherwise, he's like, you're okay." When we're saying what percentage of every dollar is left over after we cover all our expenses at a music school, you're just educating the entire community of staff that, hey, we have eight cents. We spend 92 cents of every dollar to run this place. We have eight cents left over. Okay, what are we going to do with it? You know, and you and obviously, as as you brought up before, the CEO founder is going to make more is going to have a weighted input on what to do with that eight cents that's different than your part-time piano teacher. But if you're willing to listen and share the likelihood that you'll get more buy-in from the community at large, and they understand that they're working on something greater than just say that one lesson they just taught goes up. So anyways, I'm going to pause there. Those are my three finance KPIs. And then I'm going to share three marketing and sales KPIs. Uh, which I think is right down your alley, Daniel. But any thoughts on this before I plow forward? Only thought I would add in here would be that I think definitely a mid-size or large school should be doing this. I even think a smaller school should do this. And and I do say that knowing that I never did it. Mm, but go. I also say it knowing that I wish I had. To even understand how to build a basic p and l it right. took me an afternoon to figure it out, and I have no background in well, I have no background in finance, but I read a lot at that point, but i don't I don't think it's something where you have to have a background in finance. It is just a function no. of some math and knowing the and knowing the things that need to be put in what category it doesn't take very long um, mm-hmm. and the and the fact that I had to learn it. Um, and I did it off a free website called Investopedia. <laughs> no, it is not a complex thing. You could watch a YouTube video on it. You could read a blog post on it. I just think keeping that is really, really helpful. A lot of the big schools or even mid-sized schools that I work with do this already. But I would say that if one aspires to that or going back a couple episodes, um, to, to the episode we did with Jeff about how to value your school. Mm-hmm. This is just one of those things that just gets you a seat at the table of being a grown up in business. Yeah. 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 We, a reminder, we, uh, episode 16, we did a financial fluency. I'm sure we're going to do more financial fluency episodes because it's a topic that I love. 
Okay, so let's go on here, and then I'll ping it back to you for your um, second takeaway. So, okay. marketing and sales, marketing and sales KPIs. Um, this is not gonna. This is something that you know you wax eloquently on, Daniel. You guys have great courses on this. That's You've true. taught me a bunch about this, um, but basically, you know, you need to know what the school wide cancellation rate is as a percentage of your total population at any time, right? That's a basic retention. And you say, well, how is that a marketing metric? Well, if, you're, if, like, if your retention rate is high, if your cancellation rate is between 2 and 4%, then that means you're spending less on marketing, mm. right? Because you're not needing to constantly feed the funnel to replace all your canceling students. Mm. Dig it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Second, marketing and sales. How many num new leads are you getting per month? Number of leads per month is fine. You don't need to know number of day per day or per week. It's just per month, right? It's fine. Even for schools that are four or 500 students, I think it's totally fine. Number of new enrollments per month, which gets to your, your conversion rate. So if you have 100 new leads in a month and you're getting 10 new enrollments in a month, well, you have a 10% conversion rate. You need to know what that is because that's your sales team. That's your marketing. How many leads are they getting? Your sales team, how many are they converting? And what you need to know is, are they converting at a low percentage because the quality of leads are low? Or is it because it's a sales system issue? So mm -hmm. without those KPIs, without a number, and then coming to an agreement as to where you think the average should be, what the bar is, then you don't know where you need to invest your time and resources to fix. Mm -hmm. You don't know if you have a sales issue or if you have a marketing issue, right? So that's my next KPI. And then the final one, and this is straight out of Matt's book, he just says, what's your monthly recurring revenue? Yeah. You just got to know what your monthly recurring revenue is every year because, I mean, every month rather, because we are in a monthly recurring revenue business. Mm-hmm. Unless you're one of the few schools left that are still charging a per lesson rate or something like that, which we strongly discourage. <laughs> yep. Um, okay, that's what I got for our KPIs for right now. Company wide KPIs, right? Mm -hmm. They sound like a sales KPI might be, like in our case, only Jessica's KPI, but it's never like that. Mm -hmm. We're not, these aren't individual key performance indicators. These are how are your school doing key yeah. performance indicators. Okay, I Back will. To you, Daniel. Yeah, I will just add one thing to this: that even in the last two weeks, I've been on calls with school owners, and I've asked them some of this basic information, and they didn't have it at hand. Mm. Yeah, um, and I'm, this isn't to shame or to judge or, or anything like that. And in fact, nobody knows when I'm um, recording this. So when this comes out in August. No one, don't feel judged if you've talked to me in the last two weeks because this got recorded long before when this came <laughs> yeah, totally. out. Don't um, try to do the math and figure yeah. out if we're talking about you. <laughs> I'm, because I'm not. Anyway, um, and it's just, you know, I've been on a seven to eight year campaign to help school owners get really, really clear on what their numbers are because just knowing your numbers is a huge leap forward in solving some of the problems that you have at the school, whether it's retention, whether it's just a revenue issue, whether it's enough leads. It's so fascinating to me that someone has a marketing issue, but they can't even tell me basic marketing numbers. Well, actually, it doesn't surprise me at all because that's probably a big part of why their marketing wing is out of control. My point is this, and I'm going to reference just my, you know, quote unquote, biggest project as of late. Um, you know, for the last year, a lot of my focus has been put on grouplessons.com. One of the first things we I had my team do when we publicly launched last September, mm. we made a company-wide dashboard. Yes. You showed and me it, that. It wasn't just a marketing dashboard. It, it was across all categories in the company, product, marketing, sales, engineering, et cetera, et cetera. And we have faithfully updated that. Uh, at the frequency that we want to keep track of those numbers. Some things we want to keep track of a little bit more closely. Some things are on a monthly basis. Point being is that to me, I don't know how things are going until I see that. And over time, now that we've been in the habit of this for a year, 
can see trends, can see, oh, this action led to that thing happening. Oh, interesting. Look at those numbers. Yeah. That was not what I was expecting. I thought the numbers were going to be this, but they're actually that. What does that mean? Uh, I'm either too optimistic or too pessimistic, or I'm not keeping my attention on that as much as I'm keeping my attention on this thing over here. It's just those raw numbers all in one place where I can just see it and instantly take it in, in 15 seconds, 10 seconds, five seconds. It it just does so much. And, you know, I think a lot of the reason I get on calls week after week and, and people don't have these numbers is they probably don't know what to track. Um, they probably don't, uh, well, yeah, they probably we don't know where to find some of this information. <laughs> they maybe, they, you know, they maybe don't know, you know why is this thing more important than that? Or even once I start tracking it, what do I do with the information? And that's probably the biggest one. They just don't know why the information is important or how to take it and apply it or and and know what decisions to make as a result of the numbers that they're seeing. And again, that's why you and I, Nate, work with people to help them with this sort of thing. But I think that's my one response to your takeaway. Your next takeaway. We've got, we got one more, and then I think we have a couple of broad strokes to close it. But what do you got? What, what was your second takeaway from, the, from Matt's book? This is a, um, this might almost seem insignificant compared to what we were just talking about, but Mm. I actually think it's maybe one of the most important and it's in the very first section. Well, the first full section, um, and it's just called when it's chapter seven, when you say it twice, write it down. I'm going to tell you a little problem I had speaking of the company-wide dashboard and grouplessness.com, right? Uh, This is the largest team I've managed. And I've been used to working with a very live, nimble team here at Grow, uh, fewer lines of communication. Yep. When the lines of communication expanded and there were other people that had control over domains of the business that I don't even get involved in, Hmm. We would have these monster meetings with all departments present and all these ideas and tasks and actions would be put out there. And I was not used to dealing with that much coming to me at once where I wasn't responsible for it, but I did have to manage it. There's a difference there. And, you know, if you're listening to this and being like, yeah, I'm alone, just hang with me here. Like if you don't have a team member, hang with me here because this does apply to you because this has nothing to do with team. This is actually an individual habit, which is why it's in the individual habit section. Anyway, here's the point. What I began to do is sometimes I would invite a team member to a meeting simply to take notes and write down every deliverable, everything that one person committed to. Because what I found in the early days, and we've solved this problem mostly, is that people would say, oh yeah, I'll do that. Oh, you need to do that. And I'd come back a week later to that same meeting and nothing got done. And it's, oh, yeah, I totally forgot about that because no one, there was no accountability. Yeah. And they, yeah, I see the way you're responding to this. You know what I'm talking about. Well, I mean, it's a fact what we were talking about before. Everyone yeah. agreed, but no one actually wrote it down and committed. Exactly. <laughs> you know? and, and, and so I will just say that writing stuff down. <laughs> I can't believe I'm saying this, but I believe it to my core. Writing stuff down is kind of a superpower that nobody takes advantage of. When you write down, you're forced to think more clearly. You're forced to be accountable to others or to yourself. You forget things less. And I feel in in all my work with coaching clients, including people who are running big businesses, sometimes they even resist it. Like, oh, I'll remember that. Like they almost feel as if it's beneath them. Like, what am I, a six-year-old? Am I a child that you're telling me I need to write down the task? Yeah. But it's actually, yeah, but it's actually something that a responsible, it's a very adult thing to do. Um, His chapter on this is only one page long. (laughs) It's Yeah. Literally yeah. three paragraphs. Yeah. But so so that's just the start of this is that in my life, everything gets written down. Everything. And if it doesn't, it doesn't get done. And so I have mm. built up a habit in myself that even the smallest stuff, er, 
honestly, the whole reason we're doing this podcast is because while I was at the gym and listening to that interview, I stopped what I was doing. I opened the notes app and I wrote down the name of this book, The Great CEO Within by Matt Mokery, and it got sent to my task list. And then when I was processing the task list later and all the inputs that I'd had during the day, I saw this and I put it on, oh, let me consider reading that in that folder. And then eventually I did. That's the whole reason we're doing this. It's because if something is important enough for me to consider, it should be written down. Now, I have a couple other things because the title of the chapter, again, is when you say it twice, write it down. Here's mm-hmm. just a couple little hacks that I do that kind of that will demonstrate or maybe exemplify just the level to which I go to do this. Um, within my own personal organization system, I have a folder of what I call standard responses. I do this now. I did this back in my studio. Mm. I have sixty standard around 60 standard responses, something that either with clients or prospective clients or people who are in training or in coaching with me, um, I will often get similar kinds of emails or there might be a specific kind of email that I need to send in response to a call I have with someone like like they're interested in taking my marketing training or something like that. Mm. I have a standard response and I literally just open my organization system. I click the button. It's really near the top. I copy paste five minutes saved. I save so much time every year and did so in my studio as well by just having kind of these standard response emails and it saves my creativity. It saves me time. It's more efficient. Um, it's how I can get more done. Like that's the level to which I go and, and take this principle seriously. Um, and that just speaks, I think, to the need for a digital organization system of some kind. Um, I yeah. use Evernote. It's not even a system that's supposed to be used in the way that I am using it. But over a decade ago, I watched a um, just a YouTube video of how someone was using Evernote in conjunction with David Allen's getting things done system. Yeah. And I looked at that and was like, oh, I could see that. And I had already been using Evernote somewhat, so I was familiar with it. Um, And I liked the idea that, and this is huge, that it was not a task management system like Asana. I liked the fact that it was more about storing things. So I retrofitted Mm -hmm. Evernote to kind of function as a task management system for me, but I like how I can store information in it. And it lives kind of in these folders that I have earmarked as like reference or um, a reading archive uh, someday, maybe then I actually have my actionable folders, but then I just have um, whole sections that are are reference points for marketing material for Mm -hmm. those sorts of things. Um, And then, um, Yeah, I think I think that's a good place to stop. I had a few more points, but I, I think I think I've made my point. I, I'm curious if you have any response to this, Nate. Well, I want to get back to your great use of if you say it twice, write it down moment where you said standard responses. Um, obviously, in a music school, there's all kinds of applications. We do that when we're writing a musician's journey report. We're like, hey, teacher, you're going to say a lot of the yeah. same things over and over with multiple students within an age range. So make a standard response GDoc for yourself. But mm. The thing that matters to me is that you were like, if my response is important enough, valuable enough, then I'm going to actually take a moment to write it down in this standard response doc. In other words, it's like back to your comment around Matt's book. You were like, if if this actually matters to me, I'm going to write it down. So you're just taking that extra step of saying, this response is actually valuable to this client that's writing me with a question. So I'm going to actually write it down in this other doc because I'll likely want to answer the same way again, because actually I actually have given it thought, right? Um, I think I want to add one thing to this, which is that, and this is something that I'm contemplating right now, because as you know, like I'm an idea guy. It's just like con- like in, back to big music games. I, I have an Evernotes just of so many games that we've never built, you know, that I want like rhythm games, melody games, et cetera. But one thing that I'm starting to realize about myself, and Matt says this in his book, he's like, it's much better to just get one or two things done than to have 17 things and you have no idea what actually is going to get done. It's way better. Back to your, it's way better for me, I'm realizing now, 
it's okay. Write down everything that I think is interesting, but then back to your weekly processing, because I know you use the getting things done, as does Matt in his book. He he's, gives a shout out to David Allen. He's like, this is the system I use. This is the system that actually most startups are using now in Silicon Valley. So I read that and I was like, huh, interesting. But you can have all these things written down. Awesome. But you can actually only agree and make a commitment to doing one, two, or three of them. And those are the things that actually move on to your next action list. Those are the things that you're actually going to say out loud to the team in the meeting, et cetera. You don't have to share. I'm sure your Evernote has far more things in there that you've never shared with anyone. <laughs> yeah. you're, like, you're just like, this would be a great book to read someday. Yeah, my my first note um, from 12 year, 13 years ago was just an article that I read and I wanted to save it. And um, every once yeah. in a while, I go through and purge stuff. Like, I'll just go through categories. Eh, I don't care about that anymore. Oh, that's, you know. Mm. I said I wanted to take that trip, and I just wrote this, you know, down. Or I saved this article, like, the 10 best vacation spots in the United States. You know, stuff like that. And I'll be like, eh, you know, that might have been important to me 10 years ago. Maybe it isn't so much anymore. But, um, yeah. Digital purge, Daniel. Let's do an episode on that someday. Maybe because oh, I could really use your I, wisdom on the digital purge. System. Listen, I'm not the guy to talk about that. I definitely <laughs> okay. tend to have hoarding. Like in my in my okay. physical life, I am not a hoarder. I am a digital hoarder, though. So they, I know okay. there's sh- shows like that on like Lifetime or TLC where it's like you know, um, <laughs> you know, this person is buried up to their eyeballs and stuff that they bought 20 years ago. You know, like and they come in yeah. and fix that person's house. Yeah, but um, you're, the, you're the digital version. Okay, I'm so the maybe we'll bring on a guest. We'll bring on an expert. <laughs> you know who would be a us. good guest, and I don't know if she listens to this that often, but um, I think Amy Chaplin talks about that. Um, she runs the Piano Pantry podcast. Um, Amy's oh, an old friend you. of mine. She's she lives here in my state. Um, she was uh, the chapter president of MTNA for a while, and um, mm. pre-pandemic, when I was still going to conferences, um, you know you have your conference buddies and, and um, Amy she does. Yeah, she w- definitely was. And Amy, I think she, she used to do this presentation on how to just be really efficient in your digital organization. I don't have to send Ooh. this episode to Amy and, and tell her I name dropped her at the very end. <laughs> yeah. Initially, let's bring Amy on. I'm all for getting Amy's wisdom. Yeah, that would be fun. Yeah. It'd be good to catch up with her. So maybe as a close for me, Daniel on Matt's book, um, Again, the book is called The Great CEO Within. Mm-hmm. How do I say his last name? Mokery? Mokery, yeah. Matt yeah, Mokery. Matt Mokery with some other editions by a couple of other great authors but um, or business people. Again, it's a tactical guide to company building. That's totally the way. It's, it's the kind of book you'll pick up. You'll probably apply two or three takeaways like Daniel and I have thought about. And then the rest, you might have to wait a year or two until you're ready to pull it out again and and apply the next takeaway. Um, it's absolutely a reference guide. It's not a one and done. You don't read it and never go back to it. I agree. Um, yeah. And I would just, my great takeaway on this is that Matt's clearly coming from a Silicon Valley SaaS startup mentality. He doesn't shy away from it. He's regularly talking about, like we mentioned before, engineers. But the deal is this, and we've talked about this before, is so much, and you opened with this idea of, of just trying to be the best version of your business self you can and 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 staying educated and staying informed so much of my wisdom comes from my friends in small business that have nothing to do with the music school industry right i hmm. also have friends that i really learn from i mean uh, you know uh within the music school industry but i'm going to strongly encourage people that are listening to begin to expand where they're pulling their business knowledge from and then um, try to reframe it. Try to reframe, for example, um, you know, his chapter on systems or group habits. Reframe it within the context of your music school. Rather and it's not than hard to do that. Up. It's it, not it, hard to it do. It won't be a big leap. If, if you're concerned about this, I know Nate's kept like making that point throughout the podcast, but this is yeah. highly applicable to your school or studio, 100%. And and I and can I if I can add one last takeaway is that sure. he's really speaking to companies like your music school that is looking to grow a multi-teacher studio, 
a, there will absolutely be personal habits and things you can use if you're just a single teaching studio from this book, for sure. Mm. Um, like we mentioned before, but, but he's really, a, he's, he's targeting like when your team, and he'll talk about this often, when your team grows from five to 10, when it goes from 10 to 20, and I very clearly remember some of my mentors, and I clearly remember feeling this at BMF, when our team grew from 10 to 25, that was really the breaking point for us where mm. we were like, oh, this is when we really need to start Oof. applying systems. We need to start applying a lot of these lessons that Matt's teaching um, because we have 15, 18 teachers. We have two, three, four directors. We have a marketing person, whether they're in-house or they're remote. We still have this person that we're communicating with weekly or even mm -hmm. daily. Um, yeah. So that was my second takeaway from this book is that, I mean, my closer rather, which is just that understand that if you're in that headspace, you want to grow to five, 10 teachers, you want to expand from, say, 50 students to 250 students over the next three years, then, then it's totally applicable. Mm. I guess my final takeaway would be, and this is just a very small one, um, at the very back of the book, there's an appendix called Essential Reading. Mm. And if um, I think the weight of someone's recommendations expands uh, or is exponentially connected to, oh, gosh, how successful they are or the track record they have. And de Matt definitely has that track record. What's interesting is that on this list of essential reading, there's mm. probably tw tw around 20 recommendations. Uh, what's interesting, a lot of these books I'd already read, and I can What's absolutely attest. Okay. Uh, getting things done. I've read the one minute yep, manager. Totally. I've read. Um, I've got discipline entrepreneurship, 24 steps to successful startup. It's right in the shelf behind me. Great book, a hard read, but a good book who by Jeff smart. It's on, it's over there. Yep. That's on hiring. Um, yep. Seven habits of highly effective people. That's kind of a cliche one, but it is a good one. Um, totally. Let's see what essentialism I've read. Didn't really like yep. it. Um, but you know, Maybe uh, nonviolent communication. Haven't read the book, but have gone through some training on it, um, and uh, mm. I, I really like that um, the concept there. And then there's one resource here that, as I'm looking at this again, I'm like, oh, I want to read this. It's actually a blog post: How to Become Insanely Well Connected. It's on First Round Review, which is a business blog. Um, I'm gonna have to check that one out. And I'm thinking of a specific client right now who's like, oh, I'm not really good at networking. I'm thinking maybe mm. you should send this to that particular person. How to become mm. insanely well connected. I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I love these appendixes like this, these oh, yeah. little, these resources. It's awesome. Just, um, yeah, I would just say maybe to end it, I'll end on this quote from Jay Abraham. Don't let this be your intellectual entertainment. Yes. Either this podcast or this book or any of this stuff here. Don't just read and let it be a distraction from actually doing the real work of building a business. Amen. Uh, yeah. <laughs>